All right, welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Too Black. I'm here today alone. Um, <laughs> my co-hosts are not with me, um, but they will be back. I have not taken it all over. Um, want to shout out real quick uh, the Black Power Media. Um, we have just joined. <laughs> Um, we'll have more in the future. We will be doing a debate show and a lot of other things, but I just want to shout out Black Power Media. Shout out to Dr. Barr, Renegade Culture, Luke Wong, Nation, um, Dr. CBS, um, doc, uh, Dr. S uh, Sudiata. I just want to shout out the whole channel. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah. All right. So today um, we are here. Um, we're going to talk about the myth um, China is colonizing Africa. Um, that is, that has been something that I don't know if everybody maybe has heard of. That one is not as popular probably in mainstream circles, or it has become so normalized that we don't even think about it as a myth. We just assume that China is just in Africa taking all their resources, kind of like the U.S. does or the West has done. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to discuss that, and that is in lieu of our discussion about black internationalism and trying to understand myths that that get to go outside of the American border. Um, so last month we talked about how, you know, Africa ain't got nothing to do with me or people that don't think Africa has anything to do with them um, other than, and we try to connect that beyond just this kind of generic cultural sense, but how there are real material connections between what happens in the West and what happens on the continent. Um, if you are on any type of advice right now, it's very possible that those resources that created that device for you to even listen to this podcast came directly out of Africa. Um, and we laid that out with um, shout out to hood communists and everything. So go back and check out those episodes. Um, um, but today we are with um, Mika Irskog. Um, she is a, um, I'm going to let her introduce herself because I'm so bad reading bios. So what's up, Mika? Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Mikaela Nondo Erskog, Mika for short. Um, I am based out of South Africa with an organization called Pan Africanism Today. Uh, we basically are a popular education, research, and kind of solidarity networking organization that services social movements in Southern Africa and the continent. Um, we kind of have our, our base um, political. Uh, political direction comes from NUMSA, the National Union of Metalworkers of South Africa, who initiated the trying to create like an external um, organization to service popular education needs, um, kind of network with other trade unions and political organizations on the continent. We're also connected to Abashali Basim Jondolo, which is the Shack Dwellers movement in South Africa, as well as various other really important left and progressive formations on the continent, like the Socialist Forum in Ghana, uh, the Socialist Party in Zambia, various peasant organizations like Mviwata based in Tanzania. Um, and kind of the work I've been doing the last few years has been around research, networking, conferencing, solidarity initiatives, um, and popular education mainly, which is trying to help ourselves better understand our position in the world, better understand capitalism, its development, its current manifestations, in order to strengthen how we fight against it. And, and, and give confidence to our membership, to the African working class to do that fighting and do that organizing. Um, but I'm also, uh, just as to give a few plugs, I'm also, uh, uh, I work at Tricontinental, which is an institute for social research, um, which is doing amazing work from, you know, covering stuff in Bolivia to Venezuela to China that really gives a strong movement led, um, uh, uh, analysis on what's happening around us and they do great work so you guys should check out the tricontinental.org if you you don't already subscribe to Vijay Prashad's newsletter who's the director 
it, it's a really great reporting that gives you really strong synthesis on on what's happening from a left progressive perspective. Yeah, and I, co- I co signed. No I co I'm just, I co signed that. I, yeah. I yeah appreciate the, appreciate the work. And I think the other thing you co signed that I recently joined is the No Cold War platform. Um, which mm-hmm. is basically started last year. And what we're trying to do is coordinate um, public discussion around and a public push for the US to stop its aggression and this kind of ramping up of a new Cold War against China, because it's not in the interests of the US. It's not in the interests of China. It's not in the US of in the interests of the world. So um, if you haven't checked it out, if you want to also co-sign that we have a statement very short very succinct that basically is saying any kind of war that the u.s initiates we should be against because it's against the interests of humanity and we've seen that we've seen that in the last few years um how important it is to push back and push for peace cooperation um and mutual collaboration so you can check that out on nocoldwar.org and that's uh what's his name uh, danny Danny, um, he, yeah, he writes for Black Agenda Report. That that's his organization, right? Yeah, yeah, or he's part of that, right? Yeah, yeah, and and um, he works. He's he just did an interview earlier this month. Um, it's posted on uh, Black Alliance for Peace website. Yeah. I was just reading that before we got on here. Um, shout out to Black Alliance for Peace too. Um, just want to plug that as well. But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that that's pretty much me. I mean, I have many fingers in many jars and one of them which I'm sure I'll I'll mention is I'm also part of an international collective called Dongsheng which is basically trying to share news on China coming from um, Chinese perspectives critical voices and basically to get a better understanding of actually what is China what are they what is happening there and not filtered through um, U.S. media which is often as we know very uh, blatantly false most of the yeah. time blatantly yeah. In, like factually incorrect um but also that actually doesn't take in consideration what the actual politics of of china's different actors are and what's going on there so if you guys are interested in hearing more about what's happening in china we both have a media digest which is a weekly um kind of succinct summaries of key articles that talk about you know national politics economic developments people's culture and life in china as well as we recently started a supplement which is called the news on china africa weekly which is really short just three articles a week where we just want to give you a sense of what's kind of happening in latest developments between china and africa and that's actually only the last year and a half i can actually say i've started to get a better sense of some of the bigger thematic um, uh, thematic issues at play, should I say. Um, but this is like putting in the work because that narrative is not readily out there for you. You often have to yeah. piece it together to really get a more accurate picture of what's happening. All right, yeah, thank you for that. Um, as Mika said, there's not a lot of clarification on this narrative um this is really a, a like truly a myth um and not a myth just in the sense that the things aren't true but a myth is, as far as myths are often filled in with gaps of just made up information and and kind of um generic ideas and concepts so this idea of china um colonizing africa I guess the question is, I mean, we've covered this in other episodes, but for the listeners, like, what is colonizing, first of all, um, so we can qualify this, this, this claim, like, what is colonizing? Uh, what, what is co- colonial, what does colonialism look like? Um, you know, you being um, directly from Africa, um, like, what is, what does that look like? Um, and, and how does that compare to what China is doing? That's that's kind of where we want to take the conversation. So can you just kind of clarify first, like, again, what is, what is colonialism? Like, just keep it simple. The levels of, I mean, imperialism, should I say? I mean, that's a big word, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But just the sheer level of, like, imperial confidence around accusing China of being neocolonial in, in Africa, um, when, in fact... Um, the US, most of the European countries continue to perform like colonizers um, across the world. And so in a nutshell, colonialism and in the African context had, had historically been European countries where 
we find we found ourselves in a situation in which a foreign national um, entity, whether it's in South Africa, it was the Dutch East India Company, um, which was one of main, the main driver, which was basically a, um, a, a an early financial um, enterprise that was uh, basically trying to move its way to India to get certain resources to, you know, sell cheaply back in, in um, consumer markets in the in Europe, um, but found itself landing in in um, southern Africa and saw the kind of potential of settling there and occupying the land and extracting the natural and mineral resources. Um, but essentially, it's when a foreign nation economically and politically dominates a territory for economic benefit of the foreign national and the financial class within that country, right? So that's a very like simple. Um, in the nutshell kind of definition. But what it does is it allows for, you know, some of the most rampant forms of like exploitation of African labor, la African labor and natural resources. And I mean, in school, we, are, we often were taught, at least in like South Africa, we were taught about colonialism where it was more this kind of like very bare um, understanding of extraction of natural resources. But never really, even when we talked about slavery, never really understanding that like human labor, that human beings generate wealth. It is mm -hmm. our ability to work that transforms the things around us and creates value. Um, that was not often spoken about, that it was the African labor that generated the kind of value, whether it's pure extraction, because at, at the time they weren't really developing big industries and they weren't industrializing in Africa, but the actual extraction of all those raw materials that then were um, produced in, in kind of Western industrial hubs, um, that was that was part of the generation of wealth that was stolen from Africa and it came from the subjugation of the people. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're of Af an African-American, I, I don't know, uh, yeah, 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 politics is a big thing in your side, so I'm not nah, nah, self <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely too black. Yeah, definitely. Af I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't really like the term African Americans. So I, I, I appreciate you clarifying that. So but, uh, <laughs> but you have ancestry but, on the African. But I am, I am an African. I'm a descendant of Africans. Yeah, that, yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah. So I mean, uh. And that's what connects us, right? Is this right. moment in which not only are you removing people for labor, for the manufacturing process on in different continents, but within Africa, you're also um, highly exploiting that kind of labor in order to extract the natural resources. Um, and in many ways, like depopulating the continent. And then the other aspect to it is that whilst it's doing all of this, it's not actually contributing anything in terms of the kind of technological or institutional development on the continent. So, I mean, um, Amilka Cabral, who was a, um, a West African national liberation leader um, in Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde, um, he has this great speech in 1971 where he says, like, in the 500 years, in the like golden era of Portuguese colonialism, they it was so backward that they weren't even able to produce like minimum infrastructural things. So I think like Cape Verde in, in the main city that I'm pretty sure they, they wasn't in the whole country. There weren't more than like four or five hospitals for a population of over a million. And in the actual like main city in Bissau, there was like less than a hundred doctors. I mean, this it's insane. The level of underdevelopment in Walter Rodney's terms mm -hmm. um, that the African continent had. So there was, it's taking all this material it's creating all this kind of financial capital through actually producing and manufacturing and then selling that in like global markets and local markets and creating that, generating that profit. But it's not even doing even some minimal like technological and institutional developments right. or, or kind of projects. So um, that in a nutshell, the experience of colonialism on the African continent. And I mean, neo-colonialism, what new colonialism as they say, is essentially a rebranding of that, but you don't actually have, um, oh, because to back up, I don't, I always take this for granted. I don't think I was explicit to say <laughs> on the African continent, you actually had European rulers. So you were ruled by a foreign power and there was like actual state infrastructure where there was French administration in the country. There was mm. British administration in the country. Sorry, I always take that for granted. Maybe people don't know that, but you had foreign political powers also actually administering the country, obviously mobilizing the kind of comprador uh, class, which for us is the kind of 
um, upper class uh, indigenous mm -hmm. leaders to a certain extent. Um, but then neocolonialism, you don't actually see the same kind of outwardly. Um, the political institutions are no longer governed supposedly by uh, foreign powers, but you still essentially see a state which is still subject to the kind of economic systems um, and essentially political policies that are driven from outside. So on the outward, and when you sent me the outline, you said uh, flag independence. You have a flag, you mm. have, you embrace certain like cultural life now, you valorize certain cultural life that's indigenous to Africa. Perhaps you have some say and control over certain things in terms of like state infrastructure, but essentially still dependent and driven by outside economic interests and therefore political uh, policies and agendas. Right. Yeah, that was that was a, a that was a that was a great breakdown. I think that that sets up the conversation well. Um, guess we we talked about um, about what two episodes ago. We did a whole breakdown on all Watts and Rodney's, uh, you know, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, um, and just to, just to really because he, I think he does the best job at materially establishing what went down and not just making it vague or like you said. Sometimes we'll talk about colonialism, but we don't realize like human beings produced this wealth um and the wealth that was produced is we don't share any of it in, in the context of africa and then that's sent to western countries um to, to continue to build up their empire and then similar things happen in america you know you have slavery uh you have settler colonialism and the elimination of the indigenous population and the wealth produced here you know largely didn't go to the, um, the people who produced it and still doesn't so with, with that definition of colonialism, um, this uh, there's the the claim that that China's doing that is just see, almost without even going any further seems kind of hard to believe that China's doing what you just described. Um, but but what are some of the claims? I know that um, I will read some quotes now. I know that um, in America, you know, you've had we've had several state officials make claims like um, that China is engaged in colonizing Africa um, there's a there's a economist um, this is in 2008 the economist magazine um, put out uh, this is on the cover it says the new colonialist uh, 14 page special report on China's thirst for resources and then it has a picture of of men on camels and one of them is holding up um, a Chinese flag as they walk across the desert um, you know this is very dramatic <laughs> but but it's pushing this agenda that now China is somehow the new colonial power that I guess is is jumping in to take the place of the West, which is just funny to hear the West make these claims. So what are some of the claims more specifically that they use to try to say it's colonialism that as far as what China is doing in Africa? First, let, let's even just talk about this visual that you are creating. I don't even think that's the worst one I've seen. I've seen no. like, you know, a thirsty dragon, like swallowing up the African continent. And I've seen very like anti-communist things where it's like Africa's now like grabbed by a red claw, um, like really, really, really racist stuff actually in terms yeah. of the actual imagination of it. But the big one that I think has had in recent um, years had taken up the headlines is this myth around debt trap diplomacy. Right. Right. Um, and I want to talk about it a little bit because there has been really important research being done, even in the US, that actually debunks this uh, debt trap diplomacy, which, if I'm not mistaken, um, um, I think it was Pompeo. I think it was Mike Pompeo who kind of got it going, this idea of debt trap diplomacy. I think he, it came out of his mouth quite early on um, in his. Um, Pompeo did. Um... Um, Tiller, Re um, Rex Tillerson was doing it. Um. We should also acknowledge the realities about China. China's island building in the South China Sea is an illegal taking of disputed areas without regard for international norms. China's economic and trade practices have not always followed its commitments to global agreements. As so a, everyone did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did it. Hillary Clinton was claiming that back in when she was secretary of state back in like 2011 um back right before they overthrew libya um, so 
So yeah, but but so but here lately, especially with Trump, it ramped up. I think even more rhetorically. Um, but it's a very. I, I want to clarify. It's still bipartisan consensus. But yes, yeah. very much so. Um, so what is essentially the claim? So they're saying that the that the main evidence um, for China being a colonizer is that it's using its financial resources to to ensnare or entrap weaker, poorer African countries, and not just African countries, countries across the world, in fact, um, in order so that they can hand over, we Africans can hand over our resources at lower prices. So mm -hmm. this is the so-called trap. But a lot of this, again, is plainly false because part of that claim often is that China holds huge parts of Africa's um, foreign debt, which is blatantly not true. I mean, yeah. um, from the research I've read, uh, Chinese loans between 2000 and 2016 only accounted for 1.8% of China's, I mean, of Africa's foreign debt. So less than 2% was Africa's actual foreign debt. And last week, um, an example and a country example is Nigeria. There's a, an article on fact check, which is like an African kind of fact checking site around these kinds of things. Um, by the way, I'll share all the resources because again, all of the stuff is out there. It's just not very like systematized for right. the average person to come onto it very quickly. But in the case of Nigeria, which last year, a lot of Nigerian and US media were saying that China was trying to seize some of the sovereign assets um, because uh, Nigeria was unable to pay uh, loan repayments, right? And this is blatantly not true because uh, Chinese infrastructural loans to Nigeria only actually represent 9.7% of the country's external debt. And so that's just under 10% of the China, of Nigeria's external debt, which if you read it in context, there's two, three, three key things that you need to understand. One, all of these loans and the debt conversation doesn't talk about the fact that all of these loans, most of these loans are related directly linked to infrastructural development projects. So the kinds of loans, and we'll talk about structural adjustment pro. Uh, structural adjustment programs uh, of the 70s that came from the US a, a bit later, but all of these loans actually have a material like manifestation, whether it's in like these huge energy plants that have been built, whether it's through transportation systems of better roads, building better roads, bridges, etc., whether it's capacitating certain industries, um, whether it's like you know, water facilitations that get water to people through pipelines, whether it's fiber optic cables being built um, to increase like internet capacity in, in East and Southern Africa, all of these loans are actually creating material differences in the lives of African people. In Two, Africa, sorry to cut you off, in Africa doesn't have these things, Court, what you were saying earlier because of colonialism, correct? The, correct. So that's one yeah. thing is colonialism <laughs> did nothing for Africa currently the type of loan structure means that actual projects have to manifest, right? So right. that's like one key difference between the kind of colonization claims. Two is that even in terms of the actual financing, right now, Africa is very keen and has been very keen to take on these, um, these loans, knowing that it's a loan, knowing that there is going to be an interest rate and things like that. But these aren't conditional the way the structural adjustment programs of the 70s and 80s were these are basically have much lower interest rates they have much bigger grace periods where you're given like decades to repay if necessary and also they're more favorable terms generally speaking and we saw this last year with with kind of trying to provide COVID-19 relief there were many 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 loans big big loans that were restructured to kind of increase the grace period of repayment they were either some were actually outright cancelled just yeah some were forgiven just purely forgiven mm -hmm. so i mean there is actually a totally different relationship to these loans um unlike a lot of the the imf and the kind of financial institutions that come from the west which is my third point is uh these these loans also have a, not only better conditions than kind of market loans but in nigeria i said 10 percent of nigeria's external debt does come from Chinese lenders. But what is the alternatives is that multinational organizations like the World Bank and the IMF have around uh, closer to 60% of the debt, if I'm not mistaken.
um, I think it's it's 18 billion US of 33 billion in external debt. So this question of debt trap, we can't talk about it without understanding that number one, the real debt trap has been the processes of neo-colonialism led by the US and the West. Right. And in fact, the, the debt trap that really fucked us over happened in the 70s and the 80s. After independence, there wasn't enough you know, financial capital to actually like take care of our economies, grow our industries, and a lot of public spending meant that it couldn't actually be reinvested. And so Africa found itself where they needed this injection of financial capital in order to rehabilitate certain industries, let alone like uh, take care of like public needs. Um, and that's where we got actually trapped by the US in this like vicious cycle of dependency of having to export what were also very undiverse um, export markets. So, you know, you ended up having countries where you have a singular crop that you're mass exporting because you haven't mm. actually been able to diversify. And it's because it's that single export, you end up totally relying on it and don't actually have the ability to maneuver. So, I mean, that's a longer, longer, longer conversation. But the main thing is to say that it totally differs. This debt trap myth is A, hiding the fact that the real debt trap continues to be um, due to the multilateral organizations like the IMF and the World Bank, um, who keep forcing us into conditional loans, where we have to actually restructure and point our kind of economic um, economic policies towards policies that actually benefit Western financial institutions, Western corporate elites. Um, so that's just the one thing about debt trap diplomacy, which is like really clear for me at least that. China's approach totally differs from that of the West. Um, and a tiny note is that these also just straight up lies. I mean, yeah. uh, the Attorney General, um, William Barr, I think yep. his name is. Yep, that's he, his name. Yeah. <laughs> he said, he blatantly accused China of refusing to renegotiate the terms of the loans and then saying that we that China was taking control over infrastructure. Another ambitious project to spread its power and influence is the PRC's Belt and Roads Infrastructure Initiative. Although billed as foreign aid, in fact, these investments appear designed to serve the PRC's strategic interests and domestic economic needs. For example, the PRC has been criticized for loading poor countries up with debt, refusing to renegotiate terms, and then taking control of the infrastructure itself as it did with, Sri Lanka, with the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota in 2017. When in reality, this was last year, I think, when in reality, Chinese lenders had canceled, had deferred and restructured the terms of existing loans. And this was before and during the pandemic. And they've never seized any kind of asset. And the example they always cite, I don't know if you know this, the example yeah. they always cite is the Sri Lanka port, yep. Yep. which the Sri Lankan port ended up, it was built by the Chinese or by um, Chinese construction and financing. And because Sri Lanka was struggling to repay its debts to Western multilateral organizations, yep. it ended up having to decide to uh, lease out the port to China in order to get some form of financing. But Sri Lanka actually only has, I think 15% of their debt is owed to China. So Again, this is total distortion. I don't even, because... I don't even think it was that high because I did read that report. But to your point, yeah, like they, and even in that report, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Sri Lanka didn't even originally go to China. They went to uh, they went to Western powers who didn't want to do it, <laughs> uh, who didn't want to build the port. Um, it was it was evaluated by some type, by a Canadian company. The, the the original project and then China came on and did it and like you said most of their debt is owed to to the West um, and there was a whole civil war that collapsed the the country at the time as well so yeah like but that that story I've seen cited all the time and that's their only example like there's no other story of of China building a project and then taking it over. And it's not it's not a, it doesn't even make economic sense either. It's not beneficial. China China doesn't want to build things that don't produce anything. Like they actually even if China is is a horrible place, it would still make common sense for them to want to build something that is profitable. Like <laughs> as opposed to building something and then stealing it. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, but I mean, 
this is the the truth of it is that a lot of the existing and this is on us and on all of us and i mean in part also i guess on the chinese to like how do we better portray the facts of these kinds of engagements um because at the end of the day and this is also not in the conversation let's take the example of electricity africa is a continent where 600 million this is like over half of the continent don't have access to electricity mm. and 40 percent of chinese infrastructural loans have paid for power generation and transmission like we have yeah. to read it in context you know um and then in terms of um where are these claims coming from i've already indicated that they obviously are coming straight out of the yeah. um, the u.s government um which we'll talk about more the reasons why um but i, I mean another one that i think is like really quite uh prevalent is the role of like the main u.s media you mentioned the economist right um giving that kind of portrayal and in 2017 there was i think jeff must have also stoked on this because you said this was 2018 the article you shared oh no that that article was actually 20 2008 that's how okay. long, that's how far back <laughs> yeah they sure. they've been doing this for a while but yeah that was so that was an older one i was trying to give some origin stories but mm. so so go ahead i the foreign policy magazine which has some decent stuff sometimes but it's terrible on china it does it a lot um has a lot of bad headlines i think i i have a few screenshots somewhere um mm. the atlantic uh, even though they did run a piece from um, Deborah Brodingen, a lot of this stuff is the same. I mean, any any mainstream publication, um, New York Times, any of them, man, any of them, Washington so Post, yeah. New York Times, like just as an example, which kind of speaks to also part of the the myths that they propagate, is they also had one of these um, articles that was like, is China the new colonial power? Mm -hmm. And part of their claims behind it was they were saying, um, because it's driven by the Chinese state, because they're using predominantly Chinese workers, because their only focus is on extractive resources, um, as well as a couple of other kind of subcategories. And I just wanted to, again, blatantly wrong were they on all of these facts which i find shocking where for example in the case of um chinese workers in 2017 there was a mckinsey report and i don't know if it came after or before this there was a mckinsey report that showed that um of the of the there are around 10,000 chinese firms in africa and of the ones operating in the manufacturing sector of, of the group they interviewed they didn't interview all 10,000 of them but um of the ones that they interviewed, 86% of the employees were local. And you mentioned Washington Post, actually, Kari, the Center for African Research in at John Hopkins, they've been doing a series, um, you mentioned Deborah Bratigem, um, but they've been doing a series that has been kind of tackling some of these issues. And the one they did last week was somebody who looked at different Chinese enterprises in Ethiopia. And what they found is that um, the majority of employees in the, I mean, this was a small case study of three different companies or three different kind of like employment models, but they still found that between 65 to 95 percent of the workforce in those companies were African. And again, we can't we, we can't hide around the contradictions and the, the limitations and challenges like the fact that in higher um, decision making positions, it tends still to be Chinese. Um, and that is also a, a very material and, con and um, um, material and historical reality of, at the end of the day, also, we, we are only recently having more and more Africans learning Mandarin. So even just on the basis of communicating with the headquarters, they tend to have um, Chinese people in the higher management structures. Just, I mean, that's a smaller kind of example, but... Yeah, there was a story... Just completely uh, disregard the facts and the context of, of all of these things, because... Uh, because it's not in the interest of the US to show anything different. Um, and before you jump in, oh, um, right. the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention is with regards to some of the claims that were in that article is, I mean, even this question of China and its thirst for for mineral resources, which I hate also this use of thirst and hunger, and it's just really dehumanizing yeah. um, and, and racist, um, is that of when it comes to raw materials, the of the top 10 countries that receive Chinese investment, half of them aren't considered resource-rich resource countries. 
And I mean, the most of Africa is extremely resource rich. We mm -hmm. know this, right? But half of the ones that are on that list aren't considered like um, rich in minerals in terms of, and I think the countries are Egypt, uh, Mauritius, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Madagascar. And they're like have one of the, some of the highest investments of Chinese um, private and, and public uh, financing and, and infrastructural development, but still aren't like the resource rich countries. So that kind of, that kind of debunks the, this idea that it's just for thirst or whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, of course, again, China is a huge country. It does have huge needs around certain uh, mineral resources. That's we don't deny that. But let's read it in context. That is mm -hmm. not only that, and it is also not the same kind of extractivism. Where just as an example, um, during colonialism, most of the kind of economic activity derived around pulling out raw materials, shipping them away, reproducing them, and sometimes sending it back to be reconsumed or rebought by you know the local market but otherwise there was no kind of um value added industries no manufacturing no big industries to actually produce um commodities um for, for direct sale onto the markets um in the same kind of scale it was in in the us or in europe in their industrialization period but with china more and more they're developing manufacturing they've you know in ethiopia Again, it's not great in terms of the actual workers aren't paid as well, perhaps as they should be. Um, but because of the competitiveness, uh, they are paid less than would be ideal. Um, but it still is developing value added goods in Africa that we haven't seen in the colonial period. And so even just generating manufacturing is also a form of, you know, giving back and rebuilding certain industries. And this is happening, I think, all over the continent. Um, so I think also in terms of understanding the kind of extractivist model of colonialism that the Western countries continue to perpetuate, it's not quite the same um, as China has in, in the last uh, few decades. Um, again, just to just clarify for the listeners, this isn't some episode paid for by the Chinese government where we're mm -hmm. here to defend China and say they've done no wrong or anything. Um, but like you keep saying, context matters, right? So whatever the facts are is what should be told nothing more right like we don't we don't need anything that but there's a reason why um the there these these myths are out here i mean there there's literal stories of things like there was a report um talking about um, um deborah brought again like it was uh, called a critical look at chinese debt trap diplomacy the rise of a meme and there was actually a meme that was put out um, by, like, that came out of India. Two Harvard grad students wrote, it was a meme claiming this kind of debt trap that you just broke down. Um, and then two Harvard grad students wrote papers about this. And then this got picked up in the New York Times. Um, this got picked up by the uh, Secretary of State. This got picked up by a vast array of, uh, of US think tanks. And it was all started by a meme <laughs> that it wasn't even an actual, there was no data and they wrote papers based on this and stories got ran. And when she tracked it down and her and her researchers, they found that it was all bullshit. And there's just a lot of stories out there like that where like so-called sophisticated entities pick up this stuff and run with it. But they, when you go to the continent and you do actual field research, you find that this is far from what's actually happening. Um, and I, I, you know, as a show that tries to debunk myths, it's just important to clarify these things. So I, I and it, it's not only racist towards China, but it's also racist towards Africans or Africa because it, it's this idea that there's no agency. I mean, we'll we'll get to more of that later, but this is the idea that Africans are just being imposed on and and you know and don't and don't even negotiate or care what what work is given it's just we're just gonna do anything because we're poor and we'll take whatever um now there, obviously like you said there are, is when someone has more leverage than you you know because they're offering you a job they do have more power um but it's not a simple just we're just gonna come here and build this and you just take it like there is some negotiation that goes on um we were talking about um or you were talking about a uh, structural adjustment um so just to kind of give people more clarification like what was that and what did those programs look like so people can understand 
compared to what you just talked about, all these infrastructure programs, because the because the continent doesn't does not have good infrastructure because of colonialism, um, but also neocolonialism, these structural adjustment programs after quote unquote flag independence that continue to to underdevelop the continent. So can you kind of can you talk about that, please? Sure. Um, before I do, just a little bit of context, just for those maybe who who don't necessarily understand the mass that is ha- like Africa, right? Um, understand that all that we're talking about is in the context of the world's second largest landmass, right? Right. Which our population is projected, we're at 1.2 billion right now, but we're projected that in 2050, we're going to overtake the size of India and China combined, which mm. you know is currently at 2 billion. But by 2050, it's imagined that we're going to double. Um, and right now, China's actually starting to see that they all have an aging population, which is why the population spike won't happen in the same way um so africa has a growing population young population like the average age i think of africans is around 25 oh wow Um, average age is like really young really young population we have countries like algeria that are two-thirds the size of all of europe right like algeria itself is is almost bigger than like most of europe right and then within africa we also have and I'm sure folks know this, but it's just important to to hammer it in that the continent holds 30% of all mineral reserves, you know, 12% of oil reserves, 8% of all known natural gas reserves. So extremely rich and, and also has um, kind of the biggest um, swathes of arable land. So land that can be cultivated for, right. for agricultural production, right? And and whether it's chromium, whether it's, you mentioned um, the very tech devices we're using to have this conversation have cobalt in them and wouldn't be able to, for, to I mean, Colton in them and wouldn't be able to, to, to operate without Colton. All of the kind of precious ma- minerals um, that make tech happen are predominantly um, in Africa. And this is also, we can even talk about like natural endowments in terms of um, actual environmental ecological systems that are like extremely rich and diverse and important. So that's the context of some of how how much Africa has and, and what it has to offer and why it was so attractive um, for colonizers. But so when we get to kind of national liberation to the kind of 60s is considered the big wave of of national liberation. What we have is that African nations are so underdeveloped relative to um, global industries. And when we're talking about development, I hope people understand that we're not saying we want to be like the West, but as Chris Harney said, who was a South African communist, he said, people are not fighting for ideas in their head. You know, (laughs) they want food on the table. They want lights on, they want clothes on their back. And also what a lot of the kind of left movements and the feminist movement has been so important about saying is not only do we want bread, but we want roses too. Like we, <laughs> that's a, an old song, but we want to eat, but we also want to fulfill our cultural life. Like we want to grow as individuals. We want to reach the highest forms of spiritual, cultural, intellectual expression, right? Right. So when I was saying underdeveloped, we're saying all of those things have been taken a toll on in the colonial period. Um, and for most in order to participate in the world economy which again you're coming in flat-footed or or, or, i don't know you say duck-footed or (laughs) but you're coming in flat-footed at a disadvantage um where you're told you have to participate in the world economy which is a capitalist global economy um and it's dominated by financial capital finance capital which africa doesn't have because all that it's been able to kind of uh all that it's had has been exploited and used for profits in other parts of the world during right. the colonial exported period. elsewhere and so, yeah. Yeah. exported elsewhere yeah. and so many african leaders were basically economically blackmailed into um, mm. taking certain agreements with certain um, international financial institutions and credit rating agencies and the most notorious or most harmful were the structural adjustment programs um, which were basically conditional lending coming from the likes of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, where the kind of finances you were given, um, usually they say it was during a crisis situation, like if there's a drought, you quickly ask for a loan to deal with it or whatever. But essentially, 
it was this kind of broad push of if we want to finance our own industries, we need lenders. The only people that were lending to us, because at this stage uh, in the 60s, you know, China's only been free for like a decade and a half. It's fighting its own anti-imperialist battles, yep. struggling to kind of develop its internal industries. So we had very few friends, um, aside from the Cubans, who the Cubans also are fighting and have been yeah cuba been sanctioned for the last 60 years so they don't also have the kind of financial capital that they can also go around investing even though they've succeeded in many ways and china was time. china was sanctioned during the 60s as well right so it was yeah. the whole blockade on china too so yeah and so again it's hard to have this conversation in a very short way without understanding the global politics at play but structural adjustment programs essentially were like hey we'll give you money but then you have to restructure your economy in ways that will benefit us and that meant you know privatizing certain like national industries and resources opening up the markets to international competition which you know then your goods are being sold much cheaper than everywhere else um liberalizing in general and also like really like really taking out any potential for public funding then ends up you know common goods become private goods mm -hmm. that are sellable commodities um so that's essentially structural adjustment programs and that was around um the 80s that it happened but this kind of follows the washington consensus that and was happening in latin america as well it was happening in the caribbean um to all the kind of former colonies who didn't have the financial strength to to actually you know rebuild internally um and i mean there were various forms of organization that like Af the african union in 1963 was inaugurated but unfortunately there was an ideological split within the african union yeah. and there was a kind of progressive and krumah led forces yeah. who really wanted to unite the continent and you know argued for like um that the continent should have like a shared uh, economic zone should have a shared defense, like a military defense, which I want to talk about the military shortly, uh, should have a shared currency, should have shared citizenry, you know, different things that would help to integrate um, the economy. But he was completely smashed, you know, just a few years later, actually, whilst he was um, on his way to uh, an Asian meeting, whilst hmm. he was arriving in China, he was received by Premier Zhou Enlai, and he didn't know that the coup had happened against him. Um, led by the CIA, of course. Yeah. Um, who against? Oh, this is Kwame Nkrumah, the president, the first president of Ghana. Um, so he arrives in China, and poor Premier Joe and Lai has to actually say, "Listen, this has just happened in your country," and and you know this basically spells the end for the kind of radical project that was happening in West Africa at the time that Kwame Nkrumah was part of establishing. And this kind of, for me, inaugurates this beginnings of neocolonialism, which essentially was preventing African unity and sovereignty and subordinating African interests to Western interests and Western financial interests, to be more specific. Um, and the AU really tried, but they've pretty much been pushed back on many different fronts around political unity and territorial sovereignty. Um, which you guys know about the Western military presence in Africa, I'm sure. Yeah, Africa. Um, uh, we talking about today, or you talking yeah, about? Command. You talking about even before Africa? There was, there's always been a military presence, but today, yeah, Africa, definitely. No, the contemporary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The contemporary, and and again, just for context, imagine if in 1960s you get the likes of Nkrumah arguing, we need a, we need a military. Like we need a common defense force. We need an African defense force. It never was fully established um, for various reasons. But I mean, right now, um, the US basically and, and France actually leads most of the kind of military missions, peacekeeping in quote, in <laughs> Africa. And the US has military facilities in 22 African countries. Some of them are permanent and some of them are, they call them lily pads, you know, like um, more you're like hosted at a, a local venue um, and france has uh, military bases in 10 african countries which again is always interesting that like you know one of the the big presences is in niger um which is a former french colony but of course it's interesting that the base happens just so happens to be you know um not so far from one of the biggest deposits of uh, uranium because uh, mm. france consumes uranium uh, for energy purposes um, from Niger. And then, of course, it's very convenient that then you have 
uh, terrorist groups who need to be dealt with or extreme religious uh, uh, militancy groups that aren't so far from from <laughs> these natural resources. And I mean, there was an operation in, was it in 2014? It's called Barcane, I think, where essentially the, the French military presence in the region was deployed to go and protect uh, a uranium plant, a, a uranium mine of a French um, uranium energy company. Um, so, I mean, the kind of, in terms of undermining the Pan-Africanist project uh, and co continuing the neo-colonial process, it's very much the US and Western European powers who continue to lead that. And you mentioned Libya. I mean, I don't know a better and sadder example than Libya where um, the African Union's political, not political, uh, peace and security council, um, they were meeting just a few days when Libya was going through its kind of a civil um, civil war in 2011, the Peace Council of the African Union had gathered in Mauritania, were ready to travel to Tripoli, to Libya, basically to open up negotiations. Um, and the very day before they left is when the US and the French bombed Libya. Wow, through, I didn't, through NATO I, I didn't, and, and, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew the general story, but I didn't know that. Wow. So it's like days before, like, you know, African agents, a, by agents, I mean agents for change, agency is trying to resolve its own issue. Mm -hmm. The U.S. takes it upon itself to lead it through the, you know, it was through a, like one of these U.N. resolutions, which is supposed to be humanitarian intervention to, yep. to like protect the citizenry, but essentially moved, use that moment to move for a regime change using immense violence. And also there was like lots of i don't know what the number is actually i've forgotten but um civilian a lot of civilian casualties came also about due to the bombing of libya which do you know the saddest 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 part is 100 years before that in 1911 the first like um aerial bombs in like human history were dropped in libya by an italian uh aerial mm. pilot which wow. It's just like gives me the like yeah, oh, that, the heebie-jeebies about yeah, the kind of level of colonialism and yeah, that's war eerie. and brutality. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's that's. Anyways, eerie. I mean, I don't know if I was going off topic, but I mean, if you just even use the military presence of the U.S. in Africa, it tells you also a lot about who are the kind of neo-colonial forces um, on 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 the continent. I mean, because they essentially are protecting the interests of Western corporations, um, and they've said this, by the way. There's a, there was a, in 2018 or 17, a couple of years ago, um, there was a, 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 a like public, you know, military strategy paper that came out saying that um, it was called the, I have it in my notes, uh, assessing the strength, assessing and strengthening the manufacturing and defense indus industrial base and supply chain resiliency of the U.S., which is code for how do we protect our the supply chain of raw materials yeah. going, you know, to the U.S. So essentially, these are like you know, <laughs> financial elites armed militia to ensure that certain things um, are being exported out of uh, the continent. Yeah, I and think... it, do it does help that also it's pushing down the it's pushing down the border for um, European immigration. Because you know they really were worried about Africans immigrating to Europe, and so now rather than the border being in Morocco with Europe, they're actually pushing it further and further down into the Sahel. So it gives them a kind of buffer zone from hmm. all the Africans that they have actually, through their policies, in like severely impoverished to the point where they would want to seek a life in Europe. Yeah, there's, you see a similar situation out out here with you know South America, Central America, where there's this complaint about immigration, but <laughs> the, just pretty much what you just described in Africa has happened in South South America. There's, there's been the uh, complete extraction <laughs> and exploitation of those resources and those people. And now they want to come to America. And now there's this immigration crisis, right? You know, it, it, it the, 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 the uh, one hand feeds the other essentially. So, yeah, but I, I think that was helpful because again, you're you're demonstrating the just the the, the hold that that America and the West has on the continent, um, and that's important to juxtapose uh, 
because China doesn't even have the capacity to do the stuff you're talking about. Um, and if it has the capacity to even kind of do that, it's only within maybe the last 10, 20 years. <laughs> so uh, America and, and, and the West has been doing that for you know hundreds of years now. Um, so you're not going to unearth that, even if that was what China's goal was, you're not going to unearth that in 20 years at, once you finally got to a point where you can start to expand outward, right? Like that's just not going to happen. Um, so, Which, go just ahead. A, so it, just so we're not like uh, accused of hiding anything, but um, China does have um, a small like military presence and contributes to the military budget of peacekeeping in Africa. Um, very minuscule though. Um, Isn't there one in Djibouti? They, have Djibouti and yeah, yeah and, and Somalia, but this again was around, um, it was initially created for piracy, uh, like piracy monitoring and like how to deal with piracy on the, the Horn of Africa. Um, very different from like coming to guard a uranium, you know, mining plant um, with regards to that. And also, as you said, the capacity, the, isn't it that the US, their their military budget, their military spending, I think the 2021 is like close to a trillion. It's like 900 billion or something, which yeah, if I'm yeah, not mistaken, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it it's and I think it outspends like the next thirty something countries combined or something like that. <laughs> so, so I think eleven. I think it's like uh, eleven countries. Okay, combined. okay. Uh, maybe I'm exaggerating. So I guess the question to, to I know you talked about China's build up some infrastructure. So I just want I just want to give I get a better idea of what China's role is in Africa. Like, um, you know, could you provide like not just recently, but I guess historically what has china's relationship been i know you know there's the railway and all of this so can you just kind of could you discuss what that relationship has been and and what the intentions and the ideas behind that relationship um was originally and, and how it's evolved sure so i mean again um i think that it's important to understand history and context um, because the birth of China-Africa relations come out of totally different circumstances and priorities to, let's say, the one of U.S. Mm. and Africa relations. So for those who don't know, I mean, China essentially, you know, was, it's called the century of humiliation, um, was the 1800s, where China was basically like, uh, extremely uh, oppressed and exploited by different Western powers throughout the 1800s, as well as the Chinese people having to deal with the feudal class system, which essentially, you know, put an emperor at the top and put the rest of the, the, the masses at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, if you're thinking of the turn of the century, a lot of, like, revolutionary rebellion is happening there that's, like, led by... Um, people with radical ideas about like humanity, that people deserve to be treated as equals, people deserve to live with decency. And so, I mean, um, China enters the 1900s also fighting its own anti-imperial, anti-colonial battles. Um, and so you have to understand that in context of where they're coming from. I mean, interestingly, when uh, China was kind of rebelling against the feudal system, um, the first big revolutionary break happening in 1911, um, led by what they call him the father of the, the nation, um, Sun Yat-sen. Um, during that time in South Africa, for example, where you know I'm based, um, we just had exited out of the, the Anglo-Boer War. It's what is called commonly, but it was basically a war between the Dutch settlers and the um, uh, British settlers. Mm -hmm. And that finished in 1902. Um, and during the period of reconstruction, they actually signed a deal with their kind of British compatriots in China to send um, Chinese workers, migrant workers to rebuild the mining sector, because gold was discovered in the 70s and diamonds in the 1870s um, in southern Africa. And this was like a huge, this was like our big gold rush. And people came from all over the world. And that's where like initially um, the kind of modern capitalist project is developed in South Africa. And during this reconstruction period, after this um, war between different uh, 
European descendant elites, they get say, over 60,000 Chinese migrant workers get contracted between 1905 and 1911 um, to work and rebuild the mine. So just as an aside, like the kind of labor exploitation and the experiences of imperialism, um, we don't get taught this in school as Africans, but we, but they're totally linked. Like the, the, the underdevelopment of China is related to the underdevelopment of Africa. No, that's and a so good point. When China yeah. kind of... No, I, just, I was just saying that's a good and, point. Yeah. yeah. And um, by the time in the 1950s, when we're starting to see like really strong revolutionary pushback in Africa, this is just when China in 1949 uh, becomes independent, um, becomes the People's Republic. And in fact, you know, what's so important is one of the big things they do is they try to establish connections with the national liberation movements in the global south. Like this is a really important like linchpin of the Chinese project at the time. And so we have moments like uh, the Bandung conference in Indonesia, in which Indonesia, in 1955, yeah. which yeah, in 1955, in, and actually this week, it was uh, on April 18th, I think, um, we have um, NASA from Egypt, as well as different like African representatives attending the Bandung conference, which is basically, I I'm giving you this context to say this is the kind of initial spirit in which China Africa relations develop from. Mm -hmm. And it's a spirit of anti colonialism, of anti imperialism, and mutual cooperation. And it's from the Bandung um, conference that we then get this sense of how important it is for formerly colonized nations and people in the global south to link up and to produce a united front against imperialism. And so later we have like the non-aligned movement begins in 1961. There's a conference. Um, we have different exchanges where they create the South, the Afro-Asian Solidarity Forum, which is like uh, different initiatives that are both intellectual, political, cultural. Um, so the entanglement initially with, 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 with China and Africa comes out of this kind of national liberation struggle. And in fact, the first, the first support they give was in Algeria. They sent, when Algeria um, was independent in 1961, they sent a delegation of doctors, of Chinese doctors, as a show of assistance, um, which Cuba also did. Uh, the mm. first Cuban uh, doctors to come to the continent went to Algeria, newly liberated Algeria. So just uh, to know in terms of this like post-independence period or slash national liberation period, there were kind of two key areas of support is there was political and military ideological support for um, different national liberation. So like uh, China did support the PAIGC, which is uh, the African Party for Independence in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. Um, and they had a, you know, Cabral, as I mentioned before, was one of the forerunners there. Um, and this involved giving, you know, weaponry assistance, broadcasting radio messages, um, you know, denouncing the crimes of the Portuguese military, um, co-signing on, on various like international uh, proclamations. And then in the later period, as China is starting to develop, we have more material um, this kind of preeminence of these infrastructural projects of today uh, being developed. And that the big one that you mentioned that is kind of like an enduring symbol of China-Africa friendship is the Tanzania-Zambia railway project, mm -hmm. which basically China provided the financing expertise and, and the kind of construction workers um, to produce this railway that would connect Tanzania and Zambia, which at the time was really important because these were the countries that had been newly independent and were openly talking about a socialist project um, with Uhuru and Ujama. Uh, so uh, in that area, that was like an extremely important political thing for developing a Pan-African um, project, yeah. So, I mean, other things that in the 80s, they did start to develop some agricultural exchange programs with creating small, you know, demonstration farms and, in terms of, it's really interesting. I'm sure you've seen um, China gets accused of vaccine diplomacy uh, right yeah. now with the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, we're when seeing a lot fact, of that over here. The history, yeah, the history of 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 China's medical support to the continent has been in the last like 50 plus years. Where, I mean, there's been at least 20,000 Chinese doctors that have treated 200 million people in the last 20 years. 
in at least 48 countries. And there's been various uh, medical diplomatic uh, exchanges throughout the last, you know, 50 years. So that's the kind of history of that, which then brings us to, long story short, brings us to 2000, where um, in the modern era, we have the China-Africa uh, cooperation called FOCAC, which is one of the forums that gets established where 44 um, countries participated. And in 2018, when they had their last meeting, 51 countries out of the 55 countries participated. And this has been like the kind of most recent development that's been super important because not only have there been massive infrastructural projects being built where from railways to Nigerian gas lines, to, I mean, I could name so many different things, to big telecommunication projects, to last year they broke ground on uh, China funded an $80 million uh, African Centers for Disease Control and Preventation in, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And so there's like at least 600 Belt and Road Initiative projects, which is essentially to build up the infrastructural capacity of um, the continent. Uh, and as well as, you know, the kind of relationship right now is also characterized by the fact that like, I think it's around 200,000 Africans uh, are or no, 200,000 since 20, to, since 2000, 200,000 scholarships have gone to African students studying mm. in China. And so we also are having more exchange on that level, um, aside from the actual infrastructure that's been built. Um, and, and I mean, there's also figures, but I know like quoting figures, sometimes it's like sounds a bit like vague, but essentially it's important to understand that like the amount of infrastructure that has been built is totally against the neo-colonial myth, in my opinion, um, because of course China is benefiting by having, by doing the construction work, by receiving the tenders and things like that, but ultimately part of the Belt and Road Initiative is that you're trying to connect the continent so that we can have uh, a, a more um, mutual exchange, which right now is still in balance. China still has the leverage that we, we don't have, but with the US-China <laughs> trade war, in many ways, we are able to better leverage ourselves um, for deals with um, China that are more favorable. And I don't know if I quoted this, but uh, Kwame Nkrumah, when he talks about the results of neocolonialism, he says that, can I read the quote? He says that the result of neocolonialism is that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than for the development of the less developed part of the world. Investment under neocolonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and the poor, mm. or between the rich countries and the poor countries. And in many ways, the kinds of initiatives we've been seeing, even though they have been definitely explosive practices by Chinese private companies. There's definitely been, you know, issues on racial discrimination, mm -hmm. but ultimately they're narrowing and helping us to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor. And that's important. I right, thank you for listening. That was part one of the conversation. China is colonizing Africa, that being the myth. Uh, we will be returning next week with part two. Uh, we will be getting into some of the criticisms of China that are real, that aren't mythical or made up. Um, African agency, how are Africans on the continent um, navigating these things? What does this mean in relation to this new Cold War between the United States and China and more? Uh, so just tune in next week. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, be sure to subscribe to uh, Black Power Media. Um, you can find us on all podcast platforms as well. Uh, just type in Black Miss Podcast. Um, thank you for listening. Peace out. Uh, okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seem like my homies were stuck in the hood. I just told them be safe.